with us, Professor Dibakar Mayam, to deliver the IA50 commemorative lecture. So Professor Dibakar is a well-known astrophysicist and presently working as a full-time professor at the National Institute of Astrophysics, Optics and Electronics, INAOE, in Puebla, Mexico. In 1996, he had joined this institute as a Guillermo Harrow Fellow, and from 1997, he had been working in this institute as a researcher and presently as a full-time professor. Before joining this institute, he was a postdoc at the TIFR for two years during 1994 to 1996. He did his PhD work at IAA under the supervision of Professor Tusar Prabhu and obtained his PhD degree from the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore in 1993. His main area of research is extragalactic astronomy, disk of normal and intergalactic galaxies, starburst nuclei, ring galaxies, morphological analysis of galaxies are some of the areas of his research interest. He also works on problems on star formation, evolution of star clusters and galaxies, and he has vast experience in image processing, optical spectroscopy, analysis of 3D spectral images, calibration of CCDs and near infrared arrays. He has published more than 60 research papers on these topics in peer-reviewed international journals. He has also developed astronomical tools and is the author of a popular population synthesis code written in 1995 and 1997. He has more than 30 years of experience in scientific research and postgraduate teaching. He has supervised many theses, including six PhD theses, and he has served as the editor uh, or co-editor of three conference proceedings and the principal investigator of a number of uh, externally funded research projects. He had served as the head of astrophysics postgraduate program during 2010 to 2014 as the Mexico's representative in the Users Committee for the 10.4 meter Grand Telescopio Canarios GTC during 2013 to 14 as the coordinator of science projects in multination instrumentation such as projects Megara and Weave. And since 2019, he has been the staff representative of the Academic uh, Consulting Committee. He's a member of many professional organizations, life member of the Astronomical Society of India, uh, International Astronomical Union, the Mexican Academy of Sciences, and the Mexican Council of Researchers. So on behalf of the organizing committee IA50, with great pleasure, I welcome Professor Dibakar Maya to deliver his talk on extragalactic star clusters from the first IIA CCD images to 3D spectral images. Professor Dibakar. Uh, thank you. Thank you, I'm ready. Thank you, Arunam, for this uh, nice introduction. And thanks for the organizers for giving me this opportunity to share with you uh, some of the experiences I had as a student at IAA and also to present uh, to you my recent uh, work, some of the results from uh, the recent work. Well, so I put a topic of extragalactic star clusters. So that's the main area throughout this, that's been a constant uh, throughout this uh, more than 30 years of research. So as Aruna, mentioned, so my interaction with IA is uh, basically as a research student, so back in 80s, uh, late 80s. So I will give a perspective of IA as seen from a research scholar those days. Uh, and then uh, I will also uh, um, uh, share with you some of the results that I obtained uh, those days uh, from the thesis and uh, some recent uh, results related to star clusters. So the title I put the from the first CCD images, but that's what uh, uh, I, I'll show in the beginning. And at the end of my presentation, I'll show you the results from uh, 3D spectral images, just to illustrate. So this is one of the extragalactic uh, star clusters, actually uh, seeing two really giant star clusters. 
in a galaxy known as NGC 1569. So that's an irregular galaxy. And 3D images, uh, from that I mean, uh, basically I have spectra of every pixel, every point over this rectangle. So uh, in this case, this is a footprint of a Nevada field of view. So that way we can get physical parameters from every star or every point that is there within this rectangle. Okay, so going back to the 80s, so I have uh, uh, my, my first impression of IIA was through the Joint Astronomy Program courses. Uh, well, I'm, uh, I, I was a student from Joint Astronomy Program, so before uh, coming to IIA, so I had passed one year of coursework in the IASC uh, campus. So my first impression of IIA was through the lecturers. So basically it was uh, Vinod Krishan, uh, it was uh, uh, Tushar Prabhu and uh, uh, S.C. Bhatt. So, and uh, later on also we had, there was, as part of the JAP courses, there were tours to all the, uh, all the observatories and affiliated institutes. So the, we used to jokingly call it Bharat Darshan. Actually, everybody used to mention Bharat Darshan tours. So that way we had a, an opportunity to know uh, major astronomical facilities in India. So that included also a visit to Kavalur. So I remember uh, during our visit, uh, 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 SK Jain and uh, uh, Dipankar Malik accompanied us to the, to the observatory and uh, we, were, uh, we, were, we were shown it was a cloudy night, so we were shown the Fourier transform spectrometer that they were constructing at that time. So my real uh, interaction or visit to the campus, I, the campus was uh, uh, to do a summer project. That's where uh, I mean, organizers of the JAP program told us that we need to do some observation related projects. So Prabhu offered me a project on B stars. It was uh, based on analysis of uh, photographic spectra. So, and uh, when I finished that sometime in the, uh, in the, in the beginning of August, so, uh, and after having experienced and met uh, several, uh, uh, several uh, uh, possible guides and uh, topics uh, all over India. So I decided that the thing I want to do is something based on observations and uh, asked uh, Prabhu whether he can suggest some uh, topic and uh, he, suggested that the, that the thing to do now is an extra star formation, as I will uh, tell you, and he had all the reasons, so, uh, so I'll illustrate in a while. So, but my, uh, my real uh, interaction with the IAEA members, IAEA staff and personnel was actually during a bus journey uh, to Kodaikanal to to participate in the bicentennial celebrations that happened, in, I think, on Founders Day in '87. So, so well, this is a photo of all the first trip to the Kaulur with my uh, with my uh, the, the Joint Astronomy Program uh, colleagues. So that uh, that best journey to Kodaikanal and the stay there allowed me to interact with the other members of the uh, institute. So why was uh, extragalactic astronomy uh, well, well, uh, an important field of research those days? Well, in the 80s, uh, the biggest revolution, as I could now understand, was the, was the launch of the uh, Infrared Astronomical Society, uh, Astronomical Satellite. So actually that was the first uh, survey of the infrared sky. So that uh, basically gave us a big catalog of uh, uh, all the infrared luminous galaxies. And the surprise was that uh, the, the luminous uh, infrared galaxies were not the good looking, nice looking normal galaxies, rather they were these uh, ugly or uh, very bad shaped galaxies like uh, M82 or uh, these interacting galaxies, which have been cataloged by ARP way back in 60s, but uh, uh, not much attention had been given to these kind of uh, merging galaxies. Actually, they were, um, I, I call them beasts because they're all merging galaxies that cannibalizing each other. And uh, it uh, turns out that uh, such kind of galaxies emit most of the radiation. So this is a spectral energy distribution. 
uh, it goes from the optical to the uh, saddle infrared to a millimeter. And so most of the emission uh, of this kind of galaxies uh, comes in the infrared re region, whereas in the optical, what we see is very little. Now, this is the spectral energy distribution of M82, a galaxy classified as irregular two, meaning it doesn't fit into this Hubble scheme. So basically it has spectrophotometric properties uh, somewhat mixed between different types. That's why it has been kept out of the Hubble sequence. And, uh, uh, but it turns out that several of these uh, galaxies are very bright in the infrared. Well, the second uh, thing that has been established was the H alpha imaging. Well, the one, one thing about infrared images, uh, 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 the, the uh, data uh, given by the IRA satellite, is that uh, it had a very poor resolution, more than an um, arc minute. So although you know that a galaxy is very bright in the infrared, but you didn't know uh, from where that uh, emission is coming. So on the other hand, in the 80s, uh, Kennicott had pioneered the use of uh, H-alpha emission line uh, to trace the star formation. So I'm illustrating here just to, uh, uh, an image from one of my later studies of an uh, arc galaxy, arc 143, a ring galaxy. So in this ring, ring galaxy, if you see in the continuum image, in the optical image, you will see all these uh, structures, but uh, putting a, a H alpha filter, I just uh, uh, see this, this ring, you know, which is basically coming from uh, these, these regions. I hope you are able to uh, see my cursor. No? So, well, another uh, development that was just coming was the the capability of uh, uh, constructing stellar evolutionary uh, model. I mean, the popular synthesis model. So that was just beginning because in this uh, Kenneker study here illustrated how using H alpha and combining colors, so you can know um, properties of the star clusters like uh, mass and age. So so I was uh, following that uh, method and. Uh, and uh, full scale models of incorporating all these uh, start uh, came basically in 1993. It's the time when I uh, finished my PhD. So this uh, Bruswell and uh, uh, Charlotte models are still uh, being used. And actually uh, they are like uh, uh, the, the standard for this uh, population based models. So uh, for, for in this field of view, uh, well, so my, the, my thesis project topic was basically studying the star formation in extragalactic H2 regions. Let me go back, how was the situation at IA at that time? So it was uh, fantastic, the, the working on the alpha images of uh, uh, the, the infrared galaxies, that was the, the idea behind uh, this. Uh, but uh, I realized that, uh, well, I had a, a upcoming CCD, for the one meter telescope. And uh, also there were two systems being developed, one by the TIFR IUCA group and one by the IA group. So that for the, uh, the 2.3 meter VBT. So, but uh, VBT was not yet functioning although it was inaugurated a year earlier. So, and uh, the situation was that the, uh, in, in Bangalore, we didn't have uh, a computer yet. So mainframe computer, you can see it here. So, uh, the wax system was only in Kaolur, so that uh, meant for any calculations, uh, we need to uh, stay in Kaolur and to, uh, uh, for an extended period of time. So during that time, so uh, also a PDS, photo system, uh, was new. And uh, so Prabhu told me, well, you can uh, uh, digitize uh, uh, plates, photographic plates, he gave me a nice image, big plate of uh, uh, M83, a nice looking spiral galaxy. So I was uh, uh, experimenting with uh, different pixel size to get an optimum image. So, well, to read these tapes, uh, the data was com were coming in the, in the magnetic tapes. So you need to take that to Kaolur and test it. And uh, it was an iterative process, uh, settling between Bangalore and Kaolur. Uh, to to just test this uh, uh, PDS. No? So it was entertaining, So, but the, it was clear that uh, uh, to, in order to start my PhD thesis, I needed to wait for uh, some time. And uh, I was the only student those days 
whose piece is depended on some data from CCDs. Uh, so there were uh, it, uh, there was Anupama, so whose thesis I think uh, uh, was based on photographic uh, plate spectra. So she had uh, already covered most of those spectra when I uh, when I arrived. So while well, other students uh, were mostly theoretical, there was Gangadhara later days and uh, uh, Parthasarathy. So they they were theoreticians. So basically, I needed to uh, make sure that the CCD is in good shape so that I can uh, start my thesis work. So I uh, saw it as an opportunity and uh, accompanied uh, uh, for the, all the testing runs at the one meter telescope. Ashok Pati was the one who was carrying out the test. So that was a good experience. And uh, later, uh, in, order to, in order to analyze this data, so there was a software called Starlink. So at, in, the, in the computer there, uh, in, 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 in Kavalu. So <clears throat> Starlink was uh, mainly used by, Starlink was mainly used by Professor Ram Sagar. So he was doing the photometry of uh, clusters using diaphot. So I wanted to do photometry of uh, these faint structures, irregular shape structures. So I needed to uh, really choose where to do photometry and also choose carefully the sky regions to subtract. So all this required interaction, but the installation of the Starlink was mainly in the in the, in the text mode. So I have uh, I found some images of this uh, system I used to eat, uh, I used to use. So this is the TV monitor, which is called Comtel. So and those days, the, the our our, uh, our uh, terminals were just terminals, and for the text, so it couldn't graph. There was a separate text on its terminal to graph, uh, plot. And there is a there was this TV monitor to uh, take images or display images. So, uh, but then we needed to write some program uh, so that uh, the the Starlink programs can be interactively uh, used with this uh, monitor. So, uh, uh, finally, after um, I think more than a year of uh, trial and error, I could uh, do this uh, kind of uh, photometry. So, uh, writing programs of my own using Fortran. This. Well, but uh, but one thing good about all these experiences is the work atmosphere. I engendered the atmosphere in Kowloon. Those days was fantastic. So that was uh, where uh, several people uh, were always there because that was the place where we had computer. So Ramsagar has been the constant uh, there, I think. So then uh, uh, Prabhu, Anupama, and also several visitors like uh, Professor Lambert would come with the commercial row. And all this uh, presence of all these stalwarts, and I was just uh, quietly working in a corner there. So it was very enriching to, I think, to overall uh, development as a student. And the experience gained just by uh, seeing them work was very, very fruitful. So and apart from the work atmosphere, in general, the atmosphere in Kowloon was much better than Bangalore because there were many people, and in the evenings, especially when there was it was cloudy, so uh, we had real the sports activities like volleyball and table tennis there. No, so the, uh, I I cannot skip uh, mentioning uh, uh, the the uh, KK Ghost presence there. So he was being the the head of the observatory. So his jovial present always maintained us in good spirits there. No? So, and uh, well, as the observations uh, were going on with the one meter telescope. So I realized that we needed uh, some uh, uh, filters to get uh, good observations and the, uh, and the standard uh, DVR filters and uh, that were not available. A chalpa filter was there. So we got it fabricated in the optics uh, lab at AA with the help of uh, Professor Saxena, and also in the optics lab in the mechanical workshop at uh, at Kaulo, uh, Gabriel provided some of the uh, mountings so that we can start real observation. So finally, I got the data uh, around three years uh, later, and that's what uh, I used. So as uh, part of the first work, I did some calibration work, and I will uh, touch upon that uh, soon. So 
Uh, but uh, before that, let me give you a pers uh, panorama of how things uh, suddenly changed uh, in around 1990. You know? the, the, one of the biggest change was that we had a computer, Unix computer at, uh, at IAA. So, uh, and, uh, and also uh, the internet arrived, well, uh, email arrived. Internet was still a few years away, so at least the email. And uh, I don't think it was a personal account, it was one account for the entire IA, and uh, someone will uh, log in and print the messages and do the postman's job. You know? So at least we could uh, contact the, the uh, uh, others uh, over, the, over the email those days. So that uh, helped me to get the input data for the populist synthesis model that eventually developed as part of my thesis. So I got the Stella revolutionary tracks from uh, uh, George Maynard, so from the from the Geneva group. So through this uh, public email account, and when uh, Sunatra Giridhar came to know about my attempt, so she told me that okay, she has a, a tape, magnetic tape containing uh, all the stellar atmosphere models of uh, Kurun's, and whether it will be useful to me. I said okay, fantastic. I never imagined that somebody would have it in their shelf. So that motivated me completely to do a popular synthesis model, a full-scale popular synthesis model. Otherwise, I was trying to do some uh, uh, empirically based uh, calculations following uh, Kenneker's examples. So this uh, turned out to be a chapter in my thesis and also a paper. I, I'll, I'll illustrate it a little while from now. So, but the biggest change uh, happened in 91 when I started recruiting their own students. So that uh, changed the panorama, and I think uh, that was one of the best decisions I took uh, during my time there. So the entire atmosphere, especially the campus life, uh, changed. So, so this uh, these gardens were boring earlier. So I uh, beautiful gardens we, we used to enjoy. There were people there, and in my earlier three years, hardly there were people, uh, and we didn't have any hostel life. So we also went for a picnic there uh, to Banerkata using a bicycle, and uh, there was welcome parties. Also, we had a, a get together of all uh, all Indian astronomical students in Bangalore. Uh, I think in my last year at uh, uh, in, in in Bangalore. So uh, basically, this this first generation of students. Uh, I'm, I'm referring to Anna Pune, who is currently the uh, director of IAA, and Ishwar Reddy. Uh, the Pankar Banerjee and uh, among others. No? So this, uh, uh, this also, uh, I am being a senior student there. So uh, I was uh, forced to take this uh, role of a senior student. I really enjoy looking back, enjoyed um, uh, with all these uh, activities, helping them through their coursework and the, uh, several activities. No? And so teach for when, teach, uh, TT for us. Sorry. Thank you for teaching TT table tennis. Oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's ready. Yes, I didn't mention for, uh, for uh, lack of time, so I can go on and on. I want to get into the <laughs> nice <laughs> science part. Okay, thank you, ready. So, uh, well, uh, last uh, experience at IAA was to this participating in this Himalayan expedition to uh, take part. Uh, in the selection of a site for Himalayan telescope. Happy to know that I think that uh, the observatory, which finally went to Hanley, so recently it completed 20 years. So this was, uh, I, I, I went uh, with a group that uh, went near uh, uh, near Kedarna Temple. So this is a place called Vasukitan. So our group head was uh, uh, Harish Bhatt. One of the photos from that. Uh, there is there is fun day, and we are trying to measure, I think, seeing or transparency of the sky. So, well, so the since my first works were based on uh, the calibration, so I'm showing the the first uh, uh, two papers uh, that uh, uh, that all this hard work of uh, uh, testing the CCD finally got result with the, with these two papers, and uh, and that experience gained uh, uh, helped me. To carry out uh, calibration and uh, related work uh, in the future. So recently, 
so one of uh, Indian students, uh, Devraj Rangaswamy. So I uh, was uh, with us as a student. Now, right now, he is a postdoc at Dublin. So uh, he has connections with the IAS. I think his father uh, was working at IAA. So he did uh, uh, work on the instrumentation, basically, on the polarimetry at our uh, at our uh, observatory, Guillermo Aro Observatory. So we have a two meter telescope there. So this uh, work was basically, I mean, uh, the experience I had was all due to my early years uh, in, in Kowalur. Also, I have done a more challenging work now, uh, in, uh, 10 years ago, uh, regarding the calibration of uh, uh, the, what, are, what are called as tunable filters for the 10 meter GTC. So it was very challenging, and uh, all the experience I gained during those years I used in this. Now I won't go into the details. So, but uh, also another thing I uh, I realized uh, because of my software experience in the early days is to develop a pipeline for the user community for the 10 meter GTC. So this is a screen print of the of the GTC website where anybody can download the my my software and uh, use it uh, 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 without uh, consulting me because I have provided all the cookbook and uh, I have some 150 user community who use this software for the reduction of uh, basically the, the multi-object spectrograph uh, spectra. These are somewhat complicated to analyze because it's, it will be a lot of work to do it manually. So it works uh, quite well and that's the most of the reduction without much interaction. Okay, so my uh, I, in the beginning I mentioned that the the idea of uh, my thesis was to work on uh, work on the infrared galaxies, but uh, as I as I went through the literature, I realized that I need uh, spectroscopic data to make a good use of the I mean uh, to to come to a good conclusion regarding these uh, uh, two regions. So I needed information on extinction and nebular abundances. Uh, so that made me uh, select a sample for which already there is spectroscopic data giving this information. So at those days we couldn't get the spectroscopy data of the faint objects at IAS. So the only way was to uh, get it through the literature. So I selected some seven galaxies. Uh, here is an example of some of those. And these pictures are taken, uh, taking, I mean, uh, these pictures were, uh, uh, how to say, photographed. Uh, uh, from the screen, so those that we didn't have technology like what we have today, so to get these color images, so it was through the the, uh, the normal cameras. So to take that uh, photo, so I needed to ask all the people to go away from the computer room and uh, switch off all the lights, and then use the camera and come to Bangalore, develop it, and see if something is wrong, and go back to Kowloor and. Uh, um, uh, again, do it. Now, so it was hard work just getting these these uh, these photos, color photos. Now, black and white we could get, but the color photos only way to get it is to uh, just uh, photographing the screen itself. You know, using a normal commercial camera. So, well, uh, this uh, 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 work gave a lot of good results. So, I will just, just uh, briefly explain this uh, result number two and uh, four. Uh, the, the result number two is regarding the, the extinction uh, law and uh, analyzing the data we found that the extinction suffered by the stars uh, is noticeably smaller than the surrounding nebular gas. So uh, Prabhu and I were discussing how it can be possible, how to explain it. And as uh, we were in that stage, so we got a uh, there, not much, there was not uh, much in the literature regarding that. So there appeared a preprint from the group uh, from Calcetti, Daniel Calcetti, and uh, so now uh, we know that that uh, uh, that relation uh, was is now known as the Calcetti law. So that was a result we have been discussing, and uh, so uh, independently, Calcetti uh, analyzing the ultraviolet data got this uh, uh, this, this result. And uh, now, uh, of course, uh, we got it in the H2 regions, and uh, Calcetti's studies were based on nuclei of uh, star-forming galaxies. So 
Now, for analyzing the Star Wars galaxies, the extinction law that is being used these days is this viscosity law, which uh, represents the differential extinction between stars and gas. So, also we found that the within the aperture that we analyzed, uh, there are more than one population of uh, star cluster, maybe uh, separated by around 10 million years of ages. So we put forward this uh, cartoon to explain this. Maybe one uh, generation cluster is triggering the formation of uh, another cluster and, uh, uh, because of uh, the, the energetic events following uh, uh, explosion of a supernova around 5 million years after the formation of the previous one. So if you see the such uh, uh, region uh, after around more than 10 million years, so uh, after that, so you will see a naked cluster without gas and another cluster uh, surrounded by the gas. So this uh, model uh, explained both these results. So that's why the 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 continuum light, which is mainly comes from this, these clusters, both the clusters, so are uh, experienced lesser extinction compared to the, the the gas, which is really coming from the molecular cloud there. So all these results are published in three papers. Uh, it took around two years to uh, uh, really publish all these things when I was uh, there already in 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 Bombay TFR as a postdoc. Okay. So now I'll uh, jump into the uh, the uh, what we know about the star clusters uh, right now. Well, as soon as the Hubble telescope uh, entered the business. So it gave us a clear picture of what extraterrestrial star clusters are, because during my thesis work, we could uh, infer using a model that uh, the ionization comes from a star cluster. We couldn't really, we could, we didn't have the resolution to see the star cluster like what we see here. You know? So the HST uh, images uh, allowed uh, allowed uh, to measure the sizes, and uh, it was found that there are clusters as compact as three parsec. And they have masses also as um, as big as those of galactic globular clusters. So that gave rise to the suggestions that maybe uh, globular clusters are not one epoch events. They may be forming these days, and uh, if they survive uh, these superstar clusters, if they survive, they could become future globular clusters. So here is uh, the illustration of these two clusters, which I'll be talking again in later on. And if they have mass and sizes which are similar to the galactic globular cluster, and if I, if they survive, so they will be indistinguishable from uh, globular clusters. But we are talking about a very long evolution time scales. These are a few million years old, whereas we are talking about objects of 12 to 13 giga years old when we talk about the globular clusters. Um, well, so let me touch upon. Uh, this uh, uh, later study that I carried out, so which I couldn't do during the PhD days. You know? So, well, uh, as uh, I showed you, the interesting, uh, interesting objects as uh, from the star formation point of view were the infrared uh, bright objects. So, like the M82. So, when our uh, in our observatory infrared camera became available. The first thing I did was to look at M82 in the infrared. It's well-known object. Uh, I mean, it's well-known that uh, this object is dusty. So in the infrared wavelengths, we can penetrate through the dust and we can get a, a cleaner image you know, without the interference of the dust. So uh, in that process, so we, uh, we discovered the spiral arms in this, uh, in, in this M82. So this is the K-band image, a JHK color combined image. So which we modeled using a theoretical spiral, and we see basically this this uh, part which is there in the red uh, contours. You know? So uh, so that was the uh, result. But actually, that was uh, discovered uh, serendipitously because my intention was to characterize the disk of uh, this this cluster. So it uh, carried out a, a spectrophotometric chemodynamical model that is combining all the data, spectroscopic data, photometric data and, uh, on the chemical abundances, as well as the dynamics of the galaxy 
so uh, mainly the disk of the galaxy. So we found that so this uh, uh, galaxy had uh, has formed most of its stars in a disk-wide burst around 500 million years ago. So before that, the disk was extremely faint, maybe gas rich, but most of its uh, stars are formed uh, very recently, you know, around 500 million years ago. Just for reference, most of the disks are uh, 10 times uh, older, around five giga years old, but this disk seemed to be very, uh, very young. And if uh, star formation happens like uh, in, a, in a mode of uh, burst, then we expect a lot of uh, superstellar clusters in the disk. And uh, in 2007, Hubble uh, celebrated its 16th anniversary uh, by taking the, uh, the image of this galaxy. So that uh, immediately went um, after this image to search for these uh, clusters, and we found around 400 superstellar clusters in this disk. You can see, uh, when I'm pointing the cursor, this roll, uh, all the point like objects, each one of them have a mass around 10 to the power 5 solar masses. So, and more recently, I'll, I'll discuss this result. This year, we published um, a work on the characterization of the sizes, masses, and, uh, and uh, dynamical state of these clusters, and addressing the question of whether they can survive to become globular clusters. So, I'll, I'll soon address that point. So, so uh, one of the reasons, okay, these are the two papers that uh, one is already published, other one we are. Uh, we are having a few rounds of uh, communication with the referee. So, and, and basically, so uh, the importance of this uh, sample of uh, stellar clusters is that uh, we have 400 star clusters, all of almost similar ages. So here are the spectroscopic ages of uh, some of the clusters. Uh, so which provides us a great opportunity to, to address the question of their survival. So what we did, uh, well, this uh, is a part of a thesis work of my student who is called Bolivia, Bolivia Cuevas of Tahola, and she, she, uh, she defended her thesis during this pandemic period now. So, well, what we did was to uh, this uh, 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 characterize uh, clusters that are not that crowded. So we have a sample of 19 clusters for which we uh, constructed uh, surface brightness profiles in the three filters H using all the HST images, and then characterize these filters uh, with, with the profiles with uh, with the known uh, theoretical functions. Uh, the the most uh, famous of the functions for defining the 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 profiles is uh, defined by King way back in 60s, and uh, there is a modified version of the King called Wilson's. So uh, it happens that. Uh, these cluster data can be equally good, well fit with the uh, with the, with the King or Wilson or a more recent adopted profile of uh, that has a form of a morphite function mathematically, which has been adopted uh, for the clusters by Elson, Paul, and Freeman, and uh, commonly known as the morphite F profiles. So this is a power law profile. The main distinction between these two uh, differences between these two profiles is uh, the king profiles have a very sharp cutoff uh, tidal, uh, at the tidal radius, whereas this is a power law profile which does not have a cutoff, which is, it extends as uh, far as you go. In our profiles, our uh, data are limited, and we can't really go into, uh, into the infinite radius, so to say. So, but uh, within the region where we have uh, made the fits, there is no evidence for any truncation. So we concluded that the uh, Moffat F profiles are representative for our clusters. And that is also found in uh, LMC clusters who have also similar ages. You know? So, well, we carried out a, a simulation of future evolution of these clusters. So using a, uh, using a public code, uh, for the uh, for that purpose, it's called Emax. It's evolved me a cluster of stars, so developed by the group of Giles. So, uh, so that allows us to evolve uh, every cluster in the gravitational potential of M82. 
uh, assuming circular orbits for the stars at the at the current positions. What we found that uh, well, we analyzed all these uh, uh, clusters in this diagram, radius versus mass diagram. So what we have here is the uh, well, radius is measured using uh, using the uh, uh, profiles that I uh, showed you in the previous slide. So we found that the cluster that are having the highest radius here, so are already in an expansion process. Uh, I said already because uh, in, in, in principle, a uh, stable cluster shouldn't be expanding. They should have a, a fixed uh, radius because expansion is a sign of disintegration. So in around, uh, uh, right now clusters have, as I said, around 150 million years. So these clusters uh, will disappear soon. Uh, we found that uh, this uh, along this vertical line, so it is basically age line. So those clusters which are below in this uh, plot, so they can uh, survive more than uh, 200 or million years, and some of them with the extreme right. So these clusters can survive for uh, 12 giga years. So these uh, we concluded as potential globular cluster. We found uh, nine candidates globular clusters in this galaxy. So here is a um, uh, evolution in track for each each one of them. We didn't uh, plot every every uh, cluster here, so it would be a mess. So some representative clusters. So these blue uh, symbol clusters uh, are at present here. Uh, we uh, we can also using this code uh, retract to see what was their initial conditions, and they are supposed to be following this uh, this, this track. And they will dissolve you know, at, uh, in, in few million years. Whereas these uh, red ones are the ones who are surviving. So they are at present here and they go through this track. And uh, finally, they undergo to the core color process and the radius again decreases. Uh, in, the, in the grayscale image, what you see is the position of a galactic globular cluster in this diagram. And they stay within this parameter space of uh, the galactic globular clusters. So our conclusion is that there are nine uh, stellar clusters that uh, can uh, survive for the entire Hubble um, time, and they are the globular cluster progenitors. And these are the positions of these nine globular clusters in the disk of uh, M82. Okay, so I think I'll uh, talk a few minutes more and uh, wind up uh, uh, soon, okay. And so, uh, uh, regarding the other projects, one of the projects I'm doing is the the helium uh, ionization for the cluster. So, so far I said uh, H alpha that is hydrogen ionization, and uh, one of the interesting problems to see is whether uh, helium can be doubly ionized around uh, H2 regions. So, so helium has a faint line in the blue part of the spectrum, so which usually has uh, uh, intensity of one percent of the H beta line. So this is an image of this uh, in this 1569. So uh, I already presented these two clusters known as cluster A and cluster B. So the cluster A is known to be around four million years old, around a half a million solar masses, and cluster B around 15 million years old. You know, they are separated by around 100 parsec of distance. So we got a spectra of every pixel within this. Uh, uh, in this uh, square, and I am uh, showing the analysis of uh, this spectra. The results are recently published in monthly notices, where I have a big uh, group of collaborators, uh, which includes uh, um, my colleagues uh, at Inaoye, so these experts in the hydrodynamic models, like Guillermo Tamela Tagle, Sergei Silich, and the uh, collaborator of the popular synthesis models, Gustav Rousseau and Stephen Charlotte and the experts in the photo ionization models like uh, Roberto Terlevich and Elena Terlevich, and the rest of uh, students and the instrumentation group people. No? So, well, the problem arises because the helium requires more than 54.4 electron volts of uh, energy uh, to get it in the second, uh, to get rid of uh, both the electrons of helium. So that happens uh, for that to happen, stars need to have temperatures in excess of 60,000 Kelvin. Well, the main sequence stars never reach these temperatures. 
So only time stars can reach those temperatures during the wolf ray phase. This is the temperature that is required. Uh, so uh, that happens at solar metallicity between three to five million years. So the right side, I'll ignore uh, the figure is just to illustrate that 40,000, you don't get any helium ionizing photons. So as I illustrated, the solar metallicity, you get between uh, the cluster is around three to five million years old you get these ultraviolet photons capable of ionizing helium. What happens at lower metal steel? Well, you don't have these photons. So you don't expect any ionization of helium uh, in H2 region surrounding low metal steel uh, uh, stars or clusters. But uh, nature gives a surprise, but uh, one of the important results in recent years, especially uh, uh, with the large amount of data that's available right now using the survey such as Flowen, so where you can get uh, thousands uh, of uh, uh, spectra and analyze them. Uh, the result is that as the, as the metallicity decreases, the strength of the helium line increases, you know, just uh, opposite to what uh, we expect from, uh, from the stellar popular synthesis models. So this is one of the results using the uh, uh, this plat et al. Uh, paper, and this is uh, a result from uh, Scherer. Uh, both uh, uh, see the same tendency, and uh, Scherer suggests that the uh, that the possible solution is that the ionization is not coming from uh, uh, massive stars. Instead, it's coming from X-ray binaries, especially the high mass X-ray binaries, where one of the stars is a high mass star, whereas the compact object may be a black hole or a neutron star. So if uh, you have such uh, combinations, then these uh, hard X-ray photons coming from this accretion disk can ionize helium. No? But uh, in, it, it's, uh, uh, it's challenging still to explain because these uh, high mass extra binaries take uh, at least five million years to form in a cluster. So, whereas uh, there are regions, especially like once we get in the most metal, one of the most metal poor galaxies, um, and there are several regions where the starburst is much younger and uh, you don't have enough time to prepare these these binaries no so it's still challenging so we we thought uh, um, i mean we tried to map it in ngc 1569 so using uh, well th this galaxy has a metallicity similar to the lmc around one third of solar so in this case yes uh, the 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 cluster a where was known to have wolf ray stars so in our observation, we found around 120 wolf ray stars in this uh, cluster. And we found that the helium emission, which is shown in this green uh, uh, green color with the contours, so traces basically the H-alpha uh, emission. So it's along an arc here, or crescent-shaped uh, structure, with a diameter of around 150 parsec. So we also see a empty space, a hole or bubble, so, which is expected because of so many wolf ray stars, the winds from wolf ray stars will, uh, will create a hole and most of the gas is pushed into this, uh, into this edge of this, uh, this bubble. No? So, and the, the intensity that we see of the H-beta, sorry, the, 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 the helium line can be explained completely by a cluster that is four million years old and it has a mass of around 5.5 times 10 to the 5 solar masses. So this, uh, this is the plot where illustrate that it, it, it works. So, so basically our conclusion is that at least at the LMC metallicity, the observed uh, uh, ionization of the helium can be explained as due to from old ray stars. Okay, so next few minutes, uh, I'll, I'll finish talking about more recent uh, results on the wolf race as we are carrying out. I'll just uh, scan through these results. So, so one of the problems of uh, uh, wolf race stars is that most of the information that we have uh, come from either uh, galactic wolf race stars or those in the LMC or SMC. So the sample is really local. So one of the ways to go in the future is to get a sample in other galaxies. 
And uh, so in, in that attempt, now that we have access to world's biggest telescope, the GTC, so we try to uh, look for individual Wolf stars in M81. So we succeeded in getting uh, a, a sample of 21 individual Wolf stars whose position is uh, uh, marked here. So there are several strategies to uh, look for that. Uh, so here we used uh, uh, HST images uh, in the Chalfa image, uh, in the Chalfa filter, and uh, like the guesswork of those who have a bubble kind of form. So we took spectra of those regions, and most of them turned out to be these uh, wolf ray stars in, in the center of those bubbles. You know? So that was the strategy used. So this is this was a thesis work of uh, Mauricio Gomez Gonzalez, who is a postdoc at UNAM, Mexico City these days. Uh, and uh, Mauricio these days uh, has analyzed uh, uh, the MUSE data of antenna. So it's another, another of these uh, ugly looking galaxies with a lot of star formation. So this, uh, this uh, MUSE data is public. It's uh, taken by VLT at uh, ESO. So this, uh, these data are really fantastic. They're really good amount of data. And we found that uh, 38 of these uh, clusters have wolf ray stars. So these galaxies are violently forming stars. So in those IRAS days, we didn't know from where this uh, star formation coming. So now we know that most of the star formation, it comes from this intervening uh, region between the two merging galaxies. So, and uh, this region, uh, 38, as I said, 38 of these uh, regions have wolf ray stars and uh, we count them, but there are some 4,000 uh, wolf ray stars in the whole galaxy. And this is, as far as you know, uh, the galaxy with the most number of detected wolf ray stars. This, this uh, paper got accepted last week. So it is a, a very interesting result in this galaxy. No? Uh, so we infer the presence of wolf, sorry, uh, presence of wolf ray stars by looking at uh, the so-called blue and, uh, and the red bumps. So, uh, and uh, wolf ray stars, uh, show characteristic broad bump constituting a nitrogen, carbon, and helium lines. No? So from that, we can infer what kind of wolf ray stars this, each cluster has. Okay, finally, uh, to finish my talk, I will to, uh, I briefly talk about the recent work I'm doing with the, uh, with the IA colleague, with my IA colleague, Zanshu Barbe, whom I knew from, right from his students date, days more than 15 years ago. So in my visit to uh, IAA, which happened uh, uh, actually last year in January, so I visited to analyze the, the ultraviolet images, which I'll show in the next slide. So I showed uh, uh, Sudan show some of the images I had um, in my laptop, basically the K-band image but taken with the VLT of this Cartwheel galaxy. So immediately he saw a bar here. So he pursued his attempts and uh, characterized that that is indeed a bar. So that's the paper which got accepted recently in monthly notices. So that is kind of a new thing. Cartwheel, uh, these images were taken way back, uh, more than 20 years ago. It was lying in the, in the ESO uh, archives and very good quality images with the seeing of around 0.5 arc seconds. Well, as I said, the, my purpose of visiting IAEA during uh, last year was uh, to analyze the, the ultraviolet images of the cartwheel. So this is the ultraviolet image where we found uh, around 70 star forming knots, which are uh, shown here in circles. So previous images, Galax uh, uh, hardly uh, detects around 20 star forming knots. So what we did, uh, we are still working on these images. So in, here I show a comparison with the, with the MUSE H alpha image also. MUSE data is available for this galaxy. So here we see, you see the, the green is basically the H alpha image created with the MUSE data. And in the blue, you have the, the far ultraviolet image from the, from the AstroSat UV detector. And so, uh, so in the red, you have the HST image. So, well, optical image, HST image shows the nucleus, whereas ultraviolet image, so nucleus is completely 
you know, absent. So you get ultraviolet emission basically uh, wherever H alpha is there. H alpha is there and it's very bright. So basically it's a very good tracer of the ring. You know? We are still working uh, on this paper and uh, maybe before the end of the year we can, we can uh, know the results from this. So that's all I have for you today. And uh, basically I have shared uh, all my work with you in a short time and I don't have summary, but I have some thoughts. So uh, thoughts that uh, whatever experience I gained, especially during the difficult uh, first three years, uh, have given me enough knowledge to work on any field in astrophysics. And uh, my advice to the students, if they are listening to me, is that uh, just do what uh, what your guide tells you, and in the future it will help you. you know? So, and uh, so if you are serious enough, you can make a career out of uh, astrophysics, no? and uh, enjoy doing it. And also, I'll uh, I will use this opportunity to thank all, all involved in the, from those early days. I, I think I never got an opportunity to thank everybody. And uh, uh, really, uh, people not only from the scientific background, I, uh, but uh, the technical staff, administration. So they were the ones who were giving company, especially during those uh, first uh, few years. And uh, I'm really grateful to their help and the company. You know? so, Thank you very much. So that's all I wanted to share with you. Uh, thank you, Divakar, for a very interesting talk and with uh, many new results, interesting results. Uh, I, I, I would like to open it for the audience now if they have any questions. I have a question, Duakar. This is Moshumi. Yeah, I could recognize your voice. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so the, I like your cartwheel work very much. Um, so what are the sizes of these, uh, you know, star forming clusters or complexes that you have detected? Yeah, good question, because uh, size depends on our uh, limit, observation limit. Uh -huh. and the best, best images that are available is available for that is obviously from the HST image, uh -huh. so which has a resolution of about it's an old HST image actually it's a resolution of 0.2 arc second, uh, which is like uh, uh, which is like around uh, 120 parsecs in this at the distance. No, so that is the kind of uh, resolution we have. We know that uh, at 100 parsec, 120 parsec, uh, we are not seeing individual clusters each. each image we are seeing complexes of clusters so oh I clusters see. as i mentioned clusters are less than 10 uh, parsec sizes so okay the resolution uh, right now is it is very farther galaxy it's 120 megaparsec yeah 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 that's why i was surprised yes yeah yeah thanks yeah thank you Varshini. uh hello yeah yeah uh thanks for the nice talk sir uh, uh the question i had like you i, I understand you had a experience of working with facilities from the early era to the now like ifus and all this ccd to ifus so uh in a general sense like what are the advantages you still look for to improve the observation in the in the field of extragalactic star forming so what st still we need yeah uh, look, these days we are living in a dream world. Like right? we have uh, earlier days, days, as I narrated. So the observations, uh, I mean, you need to plan, and after several years, you get some results. You know? By the time you get results, probably the idea has get changed. But these days, you have a lot of good data available uh, in the archives, especially like the news that I showed. Really excellent quality uh, data. Uh, good spectral resolution and good spatial resolution. So, but still what we require, as you asked me exactly what you require is the uh, the coverage. For example, the news starts at around 4,600 angstrom. So it lacks the blue part of the spectrum. So that, in fact, there is a blue muse coming up. So, and okay. uh, muse is one of the, uh, I think one of the missions where 
uh, the, it, it covers one arc minute field. So whereas uh, complementary is uh, the one I used, I didn't stress uh, uh, much upon that instrument, the Megara instrument, but where we have direct access, we can plan a project. So we have an access, I mean, that, that instrument has very high resolution uh, spectrograph. So high resolution helps to uh, see the dynamics of cluster, for example, I didn't talk uh, about that today. So that also I, I have uh, dynamic information of these uh, clusters. So in principle, we would like to have, but, but the disadvantage of uh, Megara is that it covers only 12 lakh second field of view. Now, Muse has uh, one arc minute, uh, but, but um, uh, resolution is around uh, uh, two, three angstroms, whereas uh, this Megara uh, has uh, much better spectral resolution, but uh, very small field of view. You know? So we would like to have uh, everything for a very selected number of uh, um, objects. You know? So that's, that's, that would be my wish list, you know, obviously with the big telescopes okay. that uh, are coming in the future, so high resolution will become uh, commonplace. So right now, high resolution, only few people are working. I, I, when I say high resolution, I'm talking about, uh, uh, from the extragalactic point of view, around 20,000 uh, resolution. You know? I know I'm talking to uh, stellar astronomers there, so the high is maybe 1,000, uh, yeah. 100,000, sorry. So. So this uh, 20,000 resolution for the extragalactic work, so you can get rid of dynamic information of uh, the stellar clusters, at least uh, that is uh, where what I am interested in. Okay, thank you. And one more thing, like you mentioned about Emacs. Uh, yeah. Is this something available online or? Yeah, yeah, sure. It is a free software. So we have worked and um, a, my student, uh, she knows exactly how to how to make it run. So it's very user friendly. So there are a lot of okay. uh, uh, there are two paper, three papers, uh, 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 completely explaining you how to run it. No, so easy to install. I think it is in Python. I think. Mm -hmm. Okay. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. This is uh, Smita here. Thank you very much uh, for a very nice talk. I have a question on this uh, superstar clusters, which you showed, like there are nine superstar clusters, which may be progenitors of the other clusters. Uh, so what made them survive uh, for these nine giga years? Uh, sorry, 12 giga years? I missed because there's an interference. Last question, can you repeat last sentence? Yeah, so what are the physical parameters which made them uh, survive yeah. for these many years? Ah, very, very good question. That is the question uh, the referee asks after this, so that uh, we have been <laughs> trying to convince the referee. Yeah, that is basically the initial conditions. So, uh, I mean, we don't know why only these had those initial, initial conditions, but it looks like these are the most compact and massive uh, clusters. So the sizes are less than three parsecs. I'm talking about half light radius and uh, they have mass uh, uh, more than 10 to the 5 solar masses. So, uh, and uh, some of those clusters are in the outskirts of the galaxy where the tidal field is weak. So, but not all, some of them are close to the, uh, I mean, around two, one, one, of the, one of them is at only at one kiloparsec from the, from the center of the galaxy, you know, so that tidal forces are great. So, so basically it is the initial condition. So it, 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 it uh, it, it was born from a giant molecular cloud, and uh, it, it was uh, massive. And usually, the massive, more massive an object is, more compact it is. You know? So I think that is the one which helped it to survive. Okay. okay thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Richard. Yeah, I just, yeah, it's nice talk, uh, the worker. Uh, took us uh, Kaulur. We're not going yeah. now very often, so, so very nice. So, so the one thing is the what is this helium, um, uh, the ratio helium to the other line increasing yeah. with uh, the increasing in metallicity? Yeah, so the ratio so, is uh, metallicity. This is the metallicity in the stars and metallicity is in the surrounding uh, 
star forming regions yeah so the yeah, metallicity i'm talking about the, uh, the the nebular metallicity so obviously because these are uh, most of them are very really farther systems so not nearby galaxies so the metallicity is measured using the nebular technique so the gas metallicity and uh, the the general uh, the canonical ratio is like 1% Helium line is one percent of the H beta line, and uh, uh, there are uh, some of the regions where uh, the the ratio is uh, three percent, four percent, that kind of thing. Actually, I, had, I I didn't get the time to tell uh, another ongoing work I'm doing in the cartwheel using the Muse data, and also I have some thirty regions there where uh, I get uh, a helium line, and uh, one of those sources has like six percent of uh, uh, the, the the helium line is 6% of the, the H beta line. No? So you need to have signal to noise ratio, high signal to noise spectra, no? where H beta signal to noise ratio should be more than 100 uh, to detect these faint lines. So that is related to the, the temperatures, you know, because lower the metallicity, they have higher temperatures or something. The yeah, like, yeah, but uh, what happens is at lower temperatures, uh, the metallicities, uh, uh, I mean, at lower uh, metallicities, you don't have high winds. No? Wind is less, uh, so you don't form wolf stars. wolf stars require winds to blow away the outer shells of the stars, and you see the interior, right? But uh, in these uh, low metallicities, you don't uh, uh, form wolf stars. And that's why it's a bit difficult to explain how you get helium ionizing photons. You know? So that is a challenge you know, for, the, uh, uh, for the atmospheric models also, because in those days and around before 2000, there were not very good uh, uh, stellar atmospheric models uh, for those ultraviolet, for ultraviolet uh, uh, wavelengths. So those days we could explain everything, but now that good models are there, it was found that most of the the uh, the photons are absorbed by the atmosphere itself. So it, at uh, low metallicity, so you don't. Uh, I mean, this, there is no not much photons to ionize the interstellar medium. So that is the problem uh, facing this area right now. Okay. Good. Good, good issue to know your opinion. And yeah, all, all those days. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, different it's, a, it's, it's a pub tab for uh, IA at that time when we were there. <laughs> so, Devakar, there is a comment in the YouTube channel. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so it says uh, uh, for helium to you, uh, UV it has a filter to map 1640 Armstrong line, uh, which is 30 times brighter than 4686. Yeah. Yeah. Really, you would this have a, a filter? Comment. comment. Yeah. Oh, OK, good. I didn't know that. Uh, so you get 1.3 arc second resolution. So okay. this is a comment from, I think, NK Pro Professor Kamishor Rao looks like. Okay, uh, great. I, I'll get in touch with the. Yeah. <laughs> so that's a great thing to know. Okay, I, I haven't. Uh, I mean, I have uh, the filter profiles, but I didn't. Uh, uh, I, I didn't really search for that information. So good, good to uh, get that information. Yeah, especially as I said in the cartwheel. Uh, so we have the UV image, but with the with the uh, few filter. So. I know the the regions where emission is uh, where there is helium to emission, so it's it's a good project to do. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so, hi, this is Karanapurni here. So yeah. uh, it was a very nice talk, and I think I'm quite impressed with the kind the, all the pictures you have. Uh, uh, I mean, carefully kept a lot of nice pictures. Thank you the for photos. sharing them. Yeah, the photos. Yeah, yeah the I photos. Could, yeah, the photos. Yeah, yeah, I could get it from some old album. So <laughs> that's very really nice. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'm happy to see this. 
Yeah, still I don't remember that cycling thing. Uh, uh, so you don't remember it? <laughs> yes, speaking is a bit uh, yeah, hazy, but I'm there. Uh, not yeah. there. <laughs> you know, it was a Sunday and my cycle, uh, that, uh, what is it called, rim broke and uh, we were uh, we were stuck in the middle of the road. <laughs> I don't remember all those incidents. <laughs> and and uh, that was an exciting trip. Yeah, and also the days in Kavalur or the nights in Kavalur when you will be in one telescope, I'll be in the other. Uh, and yeah, yeah. Uh, Ranganath would be there observing from this atmospheric, uh, uh, oh, yeah. that, uh, those lines, yeah. Yeah, yeah, he was. Months. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Oh, you forgot to mention the midnight snacks in Kabul. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> Cloud yeah. skies, yeah, right, <laughs> meetings. <laughs> Yeah, actually, actually, I was at uh, I went at the GTC for the commissioning of this Megara instrument, and I was there for a few weeks. So how I was missing the Kaulur snacks, no? Because there, uh, there that you have to buy from a shop, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, nice snacks. So I said, what? There, there is no uh, observation facility uh, that you. I mean, uh, in Kaulur we had that luxury, you know. Uh, yeah. The best thing is you can't get dosa anywhere else. Yeah, we have to go with all our nice snacks, not even yes. coffee. <laughs> so, yeah. Good. Good to recall all this old days. Thanks uh, for giving me this opportunity. Yeah. Good, good. Uh, okay, if there are no more questions, uh, then let us thank uh, Devakar again for a very interesting talk. And uh, thank you, Devakar, for kindly agreeing to this talk at a very uh, early morning in the, uh, you know, not so convenient time. But uh, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Aruna. Thank you, thank thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everybody. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Devakar. It was a nice talk. Uh, I'll come out of my presentation. How do you do? Uh, stop sharing. Okay.